to deal on what means in health environment. Lola, Lola also works as an educational consultant in various departments of education in the Comunidades Autónomas in Spain, as well as for the Ministerio de Educación, de Cultura y Deporte. He has been working with my friend, Lola. Lola, you are my friend, for a while now. And she has brought value to our educational program, the educational programs in Fundación ACE, and has collaborated with us to redefine Fundación ACE holistic care program. That's one. It's the main reason why we have invited Lola to share her experience with all of us. Lola, please, I leave you to it. Thank you very much to be with, with us. That is your time. Thank you so much, Merce, for the introduction, for such a generous introduction and your kind words. Um, I really appreciate you having me here and of course, I really appreciate everybody joining us today for and sparing one hour of your precious time. I know how busy we are to be here and uh, to attend this webinar on vulnerability and collective vulnerability and resilience from a social care perspective. Now, as Dr. Merceboada in her introduction um, sort of um, talked about, um, I belong to the educational uh, field. So I come from the educational field and I come from the educational psychology field as well. And so the concepts that we're gonna talk about today are related to um, how is it that we brought the educational field into the social care field, let's say, and then also into um, not only Fundación ACE, but in this case, yeah, specifically Fundación ACE as a, as a health institution. So um, I just want to point out a couple of things uh, today. Um, today we're going to have a little bit, um, I'm going to pause the presentation a couple of times to ask you guys some questions. Um, uh, um, I recommend using the chat box to answer the questions since it's the easiest way to do it. And um, and remember that all your questions, all your answers are correct. There's no incorrect answer. And also it's very optional. So if you want to answer a question and if you want to ask a question, there are going to be specific times during this webinar for you guys to do so, okay? So don't hesitate to do so. So, um, how is it that I'm bringing in the educational field into the social care field? First of all, in the educational field, uh, we use tools for mentoring and counseling when we work with people, when we work with social caregivers. And this is where the relationship comes to. As a mentor, we are all social caregivers, social carers. The idea of social caregiving is a wide idea, it's a holistic idea, and it is uh, really closely re uh, related to mentoring and counseling. And so also, how is it that these two concepts um, come in pl into place when we try to help people build resilience in many different contexts? Um, in my case, um, as I said to you, or as, 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 as Mercy Wada has told you, um, I work in different hospitals working with um, uh, tutors who are doctors and who are in charge of, let's say, the educational journey of different residents. And so how is it that these um, tutors, these doctors, these medical doctors are actually social caregivers because they are mentors and because they're working on building resilience in the people they work with. And also how is it that we can change or we can shift the paradigm really, and we can change the perspective that we have in terms of what we um, know about vulnerability. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna, these are, this is, um, I wanted to show you this so that you guys can see how the two fields are related. And specifically today, I'm gonna mention how all of these principles and all of these um, sort of ideas and fields um, have been applied to Fundacion ACE, but it's a more general view of it and how it, they have been applied uh, to Fundacion ACE specifically and their holistic care approach, okay? So I just wanted to give a little introduction of that. Um, this is an analysis. It's all based on many different things, but it's basically an analysis that is based on research in the psychosocial field, okay? It's based on research in the educational field. 
Um, if you guys would know more about this kind of research, where this information comes from, at the end of my presentation, I have a couple of, um, well, some resources and some reference information, and also my email address if you're more interested in looking at what kind of research is being uh, done on this, okay? Um, it also comes from the application of such research in both fields, in the mentoring and counseling process in the last 11 years, um, as a mentor, in my experience as a mentor. It comes from my experience in being and working as a social caregiver in different uh, places, in different situations, in different contexts um, in, in Europe. And also it comes from experience in being a care receiver. So we're all, if we've all been in any learning journey, we've been involved in any learning journey, if we've been to the doctors, if we've, been, if we've talked to people, if we've had mentors throughout our, our educational journey, we have been a social care receiver. We have received social care from uh, people who have been our mentors, who have been our social caregivers, okay? So all of this experience also comes from being part of the community and part of being a care receiver. It comes from information collected over the years in the educational field. We've collected a lot of information, questionnaires, needs analysis, um, people uh, writing um, about their experience in the learning process and in, in the mentoring process as well. And finally, it comes from the main conception that everyone is a social caregiver. Anybody who is involved in somebody else's well-being in somebody else's learning process and somebody else's care is a social caregiver. And therefore, the idea is that we're all part of the community as mentors. And so I'm gonna talk about the similarities between social caregiving and being a mentor. It's, it's not just, um, being a social caregiver is not only related to being a social worker. A social worker is a social caregiver. A mentor is a social caregiver. A doctor is a social caregiver. And a teacher is a social caregiver, etc. Anybody who is involved in the well being of a person, a group of people, and therefore the community. So, what are we doing today? Today, we're going to take a brief look at the mentoring role and social care in terms of who the social caregiver is. We're going to take a look at the idea of relational intelligence uh, and basically caring for the social caregiver from many different perspectives. We're going to take a look at the perspective of vulnerability, what really vulnerability is. We're going to explore a little bit about a dynamic cognitive process to social care. So how is it that we have taken the dynamic con uh, cognitive process of clinical diagnosis into non-clinical scenarios such as social care and mentoring. And finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about community resilience approach. Um, this presentation um, can be available to you guys and all the notes and all the materials and the paper behind it can also be available, okay? I hope we get to finish everything in one hour. So the mentoring role. The mentoring role is basically, I know that probably all of you are in some kind of mentoring role at the moment. Um, so the mentoring role is an educational role, basically. And when I talk about education, um, it is important. And I think more than important, it's necessary to differentiate the idea between what learning and what studying is. OK, so an educational role is more related to learning and to really understanding that our role is of facilitating learning, not to introduce people to the new idea of learning, because everybody has learning ingrained in their system we are learning we, we learn from when we're very very little so we just facilitate and we monitor and analyze the process of learning for a person for a specific um, group for a community etc so it's an educational role the mentoring role is also related to a generosity of time and what does that mean the generosity of time means that as a mentor I am aware of the fact that every learning process takes its time. Every learning process takes its time. And I know that me as a mentor, for example, I'm going to have to invest some time, spend some time mentoring a person, developing their skills as a social care caregiver. And that person is going to spend some time trying to develop their own system 
trying to develop their own learning skills so that um, it's able to then mentor again, okay? Empathy. Empathy um, is uh, such a, an obvious role, let's say such an obvious thing. We all think about empathy when we think about mentoring. And I'm going to elaborate on empathy later when I talk about um, how uh, empathy has been defined according to research and how has it been and how it's been systematically separated so that we can apply it in a practical way. Okay. And with empathy comes non-judgment. So the mentoring role is a non-judgmental role which means that as a mentor, as a social caregiver, I observe, there's, we try to avoid observational bias. We observe, we don't judge if things are positive or negative, but what we do is we observe the situation from different perspectives and we try to understand what the strengths of the person or people we are observing are so that those strengths can help them overcome the challenges that they might be presenting. So remember the non-judgment, the, the, the main thing about mentoring is non-judgment. And therefore, if we cannot judge other people um, when we judge ourselves. So the idea also goes with ourselves as a mentor. You know, judging our own practices has a lot to do with being able or not judging other people when we're observing them, okay? And we're gonna elaborate a little bit on non-judgment later. The willingness to share knowledge and skills, of course, if I'm a mentor, I have to have the willingness to share the knowledge and skills, but from a non-hierarchical point of view. I don't know more than the person that I'm mentoring. I just know different things that that person might need at that specific moment. I don't have more skills than the person who I'm mentoring. I just have different skills. So that is really important to know that that willingness to share knowledge and skill does not come from a place of hierarchy. And therefore, if there's no hierarchy, there's no judgment. So there's a willingness to share knowledge and share skills. And not only the skills that we have different, it's not just sharing, but it's actually exchanging. Because in the mentoring process, although I am working with somebody to develop a specific skills, from that, difference, from that difference that we have, um, I'm also working, I'm also learning some skills from that person, from the mentoree. So the idea is that it's an exchange as well. And I'm not only sharing skills or exchanging skills, but I'm also sharing and exchanging the process of developing those skills. So I'm not just being product oriented, I'm being process oriented. And these are concepts and things that are very subtle very hidden, they're not very obvious, but that is important for us as mentors as or social caregivers to be aware of. There's also the enthusiasm for teaching and the success of others. And this, this is something that, of course, if we're mentors, if we're social caregivers, we want and we're very keen to teach and for the others to see success. But there's also a little catch, like, and the idea is the idea of reward how rewarding things are when I am mentoring somebody and what, what that reward is doing to us as mentors. So if I observe somebody, if I accompany them or facilitate some skills in the process of acquiring those skills, if I feel a reward, what is it that I'm feeling? Is it that I'm feeling that I help this person do this? Or is it just that I'm feeling happy about this person developing these skills on their own because they already had them and the only thing I've done is I've raised awareness on how to activate them. So remember, it's quite important to understand when we're feeling that feeling of reward and if it is actually triggering our own ego as mentors. And finally, uh, the mentoring role is closely related to relational intelligence. And I'm going to talk a little bit about relational intelligence later. So relational intelligence, I just want to tell you that it has to do with the relationship between participants in a mentoring, let's say, a process. And it's, it's filled with um, feedback loops, the cyclical feedback loops. So the feedback that comes and the feedback that goes from the mentor to the mentoree and then, and vice versa, okay? So I just wanted, of course, the mentoring role and, and the definitions are huge and, and varied and wide, but I just wanted to mention these um, seven aspects of it, okay? 
And so what does the mentoring role involves um, in terms of cyclical, in terms of it being a cyclical feedback loop? Okay, I talked about giving feedback, receiving feedback. So what does it involve? It involves being ready and that I am ready to be a mentor when I'm ready to sit next to you rather than across from you. So this is, this is like a checklist that we use when we mentor, when we give social care to people and when we're trying to train them into giving social care to other people, okay? So I'm ready to sit next to you rather than across from you. I'm ready to sit next to you physically as well and also sit next to you in terms of that we see a situation, a problem from the same perspective. So as a mentor, as a social caregiver, I'm able to sit next to you, look at a situation from the same perspective and be able to analyze it from different points of view, okay? I'm ready to be a mentor when I'm willing to put a problem in front of us rather than between us or sliding it towards you. So the same as I said to you before, I'm sitting right next to you, okay? We're looking at the problem from the same perspective, from the same uh, place, let's say, from the same side of the table and so the problem, the situation is in front of us and we're able to see it, to dissect it, to analyze it and to come to conclusions together. I'm ready to be a mentor when I'm ready to listen, which is really important. Sometimes silence is really, really important in the process of mentoring. When I'm ready to ask questions and not be afraid to ask questions and accept that maybe I may not fully understand the issue at hand. As a mentor, it's okay not to be able to understand completely, even if I'm an expert, let's say, um, at a different, uh, at a specific thing. It's okay if I don't fully understand the issue at hand. And it's okay to express that uh, lack of understanding. Sometimes it is very challenging for us mentors to understand a situation with one or two or three sessions. We might need to listen more we might need to pay more attention. We might need to ask more questions, but that's okay. Because then that opens up the system of communication, okay? I'm able to be, or I can be a mentor when I recognize your strengths and how you can use them to address your challenges. I already talked a little bit about this in the non-judgmental part, but here there is a very important thing to point out. And, the, and it's, very, um, it's very important to point out that when we observe and there's no observational bias, we're able to see the strengths of a person and turn the strengths into, um, into, let's say, tools and strategies so that they can address any challenge that they have in front of them. The other thing to take into account is that I can be a mentor when I can hold you accountable without shaming or blaming. I can talk to you about the things that are not very comfortable to talk about. It's okay to feel uncomfortable. So I'm trying to help you feel comfortable with feeling uncomfortable. You know, I can talk to you about a situation, a behavior that maybe could change and maybe could improve your own practice. So I can hold you accountable. I can ask you questions. We can analyze the situation together, but without shaming or blaming. So here is really important as mentors, as, as leaders, as mentors, as caregivers, to understand the difference between shaming and guilt. So everybody feels guilt. Guilt is a normal feeling that we have. We feel guilty about something we've done. We feel guilty about a mistake we've made, etc. And so feeling guilty is actually healthy because it has to do with something that we've done and something that we can change. And we don't associate that thing that we've done with who we are. We've made, we've made a mistake, we have something to learn, we feel bad about it, we feel guilty about it, we can change it. The difference with shaming is that it's not about something you do. You feel ashamed with who you are as a person. And sometimes, you know, I have to work with people who love their profession and I'm mentoring these people into sort of taking some strategies, whatever, and they love the profession so much that the actions that they take are so attached to who they are that they see that their actions and what role they take in a company or in an institution or in a school, et cetera, is, who, is what defines them as a person. And as a mentor, it's really important to help them detach this idea from who they are and what they're doing 
and so that they don't feel shame because with shame comes, um, we can see people who feel a little bit stuck when they feel shame. But when they feel guilt and they feel they've made a mistake, it's different because they can change that behavior. Okay, so the, so pointing out, making explicit the idea and the difference between shame and guilt is really important. Um, I'm open to owning my part. As a mentor, I have a part to play. So I can own my part when I realize that sometimes, because as mentors and as social caregivers, we are, um, we're in, it's, it's not a very easy role, let's say. It's quite challenging. And so what happens is that maybe in the first, second session, working with people in the mentoring process, whoever we are, we're coordinating a program, for example, there might have been a moment in which we felt that our ego was triggered and then we, our survival strategies were triggered somehow emotionally, psychologically, etc. And so only my part means to understand if any of these actions that the people I'm working with and I'm involved with in the mentoring process have triggered and to be aware of it, to be conscious of it, to take on the next step and to change that. And that is an internal process that we mentors have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis because we uh, have a lot of emotional exposure, let's say, okay? And finally, I can model the vulnerability. I am able to be vulnerable. I am courageous enough, which is really hard and challenging. I'm brave enough to be vulnerable and open because I expect the same from the person I am um, caregiving, from the person I'm offering care. So I can model the vulnerability and openness that I expect. I can talk about my own story. I can reach out. I can ask more questions. I can express the fact that I may not understand something and that I need more information so that the other person can open up as well. Okay. So I hope that that was clear. Um, there are many more things that we use, but these are some of the checklists. Well, this is basically a checklist that we use when we internalize and we deconstruct how we are acting as mentors in any sort of environment. What about social caring? So we've talked about mentoring and what about social caring? And you'll find that there are many, many similarities and it's basically, it's almost the same. So social caring focuses on the immaterial and immeasurable, things that are really internal, really abstract, that are about um, relationships, unspoken communication, etc. So it focuses on the immaterial and immeasurable in relationship to the caring process. And it's caring beyond interpersonal responsibility. It's not just about the person I'm working with, if I'm working with that person, it's about modeling skills and working on these skills because this person is gonna go out to society, is gonna go out to the community. So we not only have an interpersonal relation uh, responsibility, we have a social responsibility, which is wider and which is bigger, okay? It concentrates on detail and subtle aspects of the relationship. There's so many subtle aspects that the more experience we have as a mentor, as a social carer, the more we can see. And there are things that are very obvious, but there are things that are not obvious and they're very subtle. For example, in a relationship, if I'm trying to help a group of um, medical doctors who are giving um, mentoring or tutoring to a group of residents, uh, for me, for example, when I observe these interactions, I have to be able to observe and try to notice the subtle aspects of that relationship and to see if there's any vulnerability cycles and survival strategies being activated so that we can help in the learning process. And that is related to being open, being receptive, using silence as a tool, listening, asking questions, being willing, and of course, being emotionally available um, and finally, social caring has a psychos, psychos, psychological presence, sorry, in focusing on people being together. So it focuses on relationships. We've been talking about relationships here from the beginning, okay? So it has to do with interpersonal relationships in a group, in a better people, in a family unit, etc. Interpersonal relationships and things that happen that are unspoken. So there's a lot of unspoken communication and patterns that we can find when we analyze the beautiful complexity of human beings in a relationship. So what's the relationship, let's say, similarities between the mentoring process and social care? I'm just going to point out a couple here. 
Okay, um, I'm going to ask you guys to use the chat box to share one idea. So I've talked about the mentoring process and I've talked about social care. Can you guys share one idea of what you think there could be? What similarities do you, do you think there could be between these two concepts, the mentoring process and social care? I'm going to open the chat box. Please use the chat box to, to write one idea. Remember, all your ideas are correct because they're based on your experience. And it's also voluntary. If you would not like to write anything about it, then it's absolutely fine. I'm just going to wait for a couple of minutes. Empathy, thank you, Carla. Thank you so much for joining us as well. Uh, empathy, yes. So there's empathy in the relationship and I'm gonna elaborate on that. Thank you. Um, anybody else? To be able to listen and there's no judgment. Thank you, Alba. Thank you so much. Helping others, exactly. So that's the similarity. We're all in this together. We're all social caregivers and therefore we're all mentors in the end, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody else would like to share anything else? Okay, fantastic guys, dynamic, yes, it's a dynamic process. It comes and goes, and that's what we call it as cyclical feedback loops. Thank you so much, Rogelio. Isabel, it gives you the opportunity to grow to exactly, as a mentor, we're always questioning our own, uh, our own survival strategies that we develop. Whenever I talk about survival strategies, maybe it sounds a little bit um, strange, but survival strategies are basically what we have, de what we developed uh, growing up in terms of, um, in order to survive. And what does that mean? Um, I'm gonna go back to the presentation now. Okay, thank you so much guys for participating. It's lovely. Patience and awareness. Yes, Ben, thank you so much for your ideas. Um, patience and awareness of other needs and difficulties. And this comes from a place of vulnerability. If I'm able to show my own vulnerabilities, I'm able to understand the needs of the other person. And this happens constantly in the mentoring process. And Sergi, insight, exactly, to be able to understand and there's insight in what whatever is going on and we can see beyond the obvious. All right, guys, super, thank you so much. I'm gonna go back to the presentation now, okay? So I was talking a little bit about the the uh, the survival strategy so survival strategies is what we commonly name or we commonly uh, call uh, protection mechanisms or defense mechanisms now when we call it defense mechanisms or protection mechanisms there's an element of judgment so at least in education in the educational field when we observe when we mentor when we counsel um, we don't call them defense mechanisms or protective mechanisms. We actually call them survival strategies because those defense mechanisms and protection mechanisms are actually, although they are defense and protection, they came from a place of survival, of emotional survival when we grow up. And so a lot of people demonstrate survival strategies, for example, by feeling very defensive, by overcompensating, pleasing, um, uh, detaching, distancing themselves from a situation, protecting themselves very much. And so we have discovered that by using the word or the word survival strategy, we are not, as mentors, we are not being judgmental on what the other person is doing because they needed to, to present these behaviors in order to survive emotionally to different situations while we grow up throughout our lives. So that's what we call them survival strategies. And sometimes as a mentor, no, uh, you guys were talking about insight. So to have an understanding as well of what survival strategies are being triggered in me as a mentor while I'm giving the mentoring process. So that is really important to be aware of it. Survival strategies are, are linked to the development of the ego. And so sometimes, you know, are these things triggering our egos? Are these things triggering the person I'm mentoring, the ego in the person I'm mentoring? How is that happening? And this is just awareness. Ego is not a judgmental way of talking about the survival strategies. The ego exists and it's actually not a bad thing. We have a lot to thank to our ego because it helped us survive throughout a lot of emotional challenges. And so it's just being aware 
who is acting? Is it my ego acting? Is it me acting? What responses and feedback I'm getting to the person I'm mentoring that are triggering my survival strategies? Am I aware of my survival strategies? Okay, so I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about this because I keep talking about survival strategies, but I haven't put it in my presentation. Okay, so here I'm going to look at the, uh, the similarities between the mentoring role and the social care role. So they're both developmental. There's a beginning, there's a middle, there could be an end, there's follow-up appointments or there's follow-up sessions, etc. So it's developmental. It starts somewhere, it ends somewhere else. It's active and proactive. We have as, as mentors and social caregivers, we have a committed responsibility for another person's development. That doesn't mean that we have a pressure responsibility and it's not just up to us. We have the responsibility to be able to be proactive about our own sort of understanding and the construction of such survival strategies that I've been talking to you about because we have the responsibility of caring for people We have to, and not being judgmental to people. We cannot be judgmental to ourselves. So we need to do that internal work on ourselves as well to be able to give that kind of feedback. They involve a connected society because it's all about relationships. It's all about uh, the things that we cannot see and the interactions that happen in this feedback loop of being in a relationship. The mentor is also a social caregiver, of course. There's an availability to another's needs. As Ben was saying a minute ago, we need to be aware of what other people's need of other people's needs, right? And so be aware and not trying to, and, and understanding those needs and talking about those needs. And therefore we run, for example, a needs analysis, right? And so those needs, why they're not meant, met, uh, what, what we need to do to meet those needs, but also understanding that it's not pleasing those needs, it's meeting the needs. And that's, that's also a difference, okay? Um, they are receptive to emotional needs. Both of them are receptive to emotional needs. They don't just see, a, we don't just see a person that only needs cognitive needs. We see a person that needs, a behave, that has behavioral needs and that has emotional needs as well. And finally, they offer a caring presence and encourage, of course, relational intelligence, okay? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about relational intelligence now. Okay, so, oh, therefore, the mentor is the caregiver of the caregiver, basically, and the cycle continues, right? And so what is caring for the social caregiver? It has to do with our role as mentors for the social caregiver. And who is a social caregiver? I said it at the beginning of the presentation. It's not only the social worker. The social worker is, is such an important, has such an important role in the social caregiving, let's say, system. But we're not just talking about the social care worker the social or the social worker. We're talking about, for example, somebody, anybody who is in charge of a group, in charge of who is involved, sorry, in the well-being of a group of people. Um, here is Sylvia. Sylvia teaches in Zaragoza and I'm, and I'm, and let's say I am in the, I'm in the mentoring team working with her. She is a mentor and a social caregiver to primary school students. She's a mentor and a social caregiver to teachers because she's a coordinator. She's a social caregiver and a mentor to parents because she has to speak to a lot of families. And also she's a social care and um, she's a care receiver because I work as her social caregiver. Okay, so anybody who's in charge of this. Um, this is Laura Romero. She's um, part of a mentoring process, in a mentoring program that I uh, work at in Valdebron Hospital. She's a thoracic surgeon, and right next to her is her uh, resident, let's say resident, a resident doctor that she works with. She works with this group of residents, and they're at the ICU unit at the moment during the pandemic, uh, a couple of weeks ago, sorry. And, um, and she is also a social caregiver. She's also a mentor to this group of uh, residents. She's a mentor to sick people at the ICU unit during the pandemic. And she's also uh, a social caregiver, of course, okay? Not just a health caregiver. Uh, and she's also a care receiver because we work on um, different skills and different things that she could do to work with her mentorees, okay? so. Everyone at some point is a social caregiver, a mentor, and a care receiver. So 
Now, what is relational intelligence and what's the relationship uh, with, um, with mentoring and being the social caregiver? Relational intelligence is basically a systemic process. It's a dynamic process, it's a systemic process. Uh, it has different um, steps. It's a systemic process of understanding the multiplicity of perspectives via empathy, via non-judgment, the multiplicity of perspectives in a group of people or with just one person, and how often the relationships are made of feedback loops. We can see feedback loops everywhere, spoken and unspoken. In all the interactions and essential qualities among the relationship participants, which includes myself as a social caregiver, as a caregiver in general, as a mentor. I am also part of it. So I have sort of like a double role. I look at it from the perspective of relational intelligence from the outside and I look at it from the inside as well because I'm part of it. So how does relational intelligence influence the mentoring process to make it a holistic model of care? Okay, so I'm not going to ask you guys to, to write down um, this part. I'm going to ask you guys um, later, okay, because I don't want to run out of time. But I'm going to elaborate a little bit on how relational intelligence influences the mentoring process to make it a, a holistic model of care. And this is what, this is, these are the ideas and the concepts in which um, Fundación ACE has based their holistic care approach and program. So what does a holistic model of care involve. It involves that we see a person from three different perspectives. We see a person as an emotional being. How am I feeling? How's that person feeling? How's that mentoree feeling? How's that caregiver feeling? What is that caregiver doing? What's that person doing from the behavioral point of view? How are these feelings being represented and how they're being, um, um, what's the evidence of those uh, feelings? And finally, the concept, the cognitive side of things. Why is it that that person is acting, feeling like that? So there's a reasoning behind it. Okay, so we try to address it and we try to give the emotional needs the same hierarchy as the cognitive needs as well. Since we're made of these three, biologically and naturally. And so being a mentor to caregiving people, let's say, um, brings a holistic model of care. So from the three corners that we just looked at, the emotional corner. What is the caregiver feeling? <clears throat> Excuse me. All feelings are valid. Coming from the idea that all feelings are valid. What is the caregiver feeling? How is the caregiver manifesting such feelings? How is the caregiver manifesting such feelings? What are they doing? There's an evidence of the feeling. And finally, analyzing the reason behind these behaviors, behind this feeling. Why is the caregiver feeling like that? Okay, or feeling that and then trying to make them aware, analyze it from these three perspectives, that all feelings are valid, that we can analyze those behaviors and we can separate those behaviors from what we're feeling. We can change those behaviors probably or continue with those behaviors. So how do some behaviors help us in terms of emotionally regulate uh, ourselves? Okay, and then the reason behind those behaviors. And so therefore we reach a social caregiver center model where the caregiver is at the center of, of these three sort of corners, okay? We're going to analyze a little bit the emotional side of things related to the behavioral side of things, but from a psychosocial point of view, okay? And so it all starts for them to be able to understand that the emotional corner, let's say, has the same hierarchy as the other two. Um, I'd like to redefine, I'm sure you guys are aware of this, but just redefine the notion of what vulnerability means, okay? Which is something that we've been working in different schools through uh, trainer training, you know? So for many years and, many t and a lot of time, being vulnerable has been defined as being weak. And so the idea is to sh shift the paradigm. The being vulnerable or vulnerability is defined as uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. And it doesn't sound like it, but these three things are the things that make us strong. So being vulnerable is actually being strong because we're dealing with uncertainty, we're dealing with risk, we're taking risks and making decisions, and we're dealing with expose ourselves emotionally, which is one of the scariest things we could ever go through, right? So how do we do this from a practical point of view? 
we raise the caregiver's awareness of uncertainty, what uncertainty means, of not judging uncertainty. Uncertainty is not bad or good, it just is. It's just there. By actually raising awareness of their decisions and risks taken toward better care. They've taken some decisions, that they've taken some risks. Those risks are sometimes based on uncertainty and they've taken those risks towards better care. And finally, raising awareness of how they can share their emotions and that it's okay to share emotions because it has exactly the same value as sharing knowledge. So sharing emotions is exactly the same because we have it anyway, and it's okay. And so all of these four things contribute towards strengthening their skills as social caregivers. So they're able to understand uncertainty. So they're gonna be able to understand their own uncertainty. And therefore when they go and take care of somebody and care for somebody or fulfill their caregiving duties they're able to see uncertainty and teach and help the people they're caring for to see uncertainty and not judge uncertainty but just let's say accept it um the same with risk and the same with emotional exposure and therefore the more vulnerabilities the caregivers express the stronger they become and it sounds a little bit, um, it sounds a little bit opposite to say that the more vulnerabilities the caregivers express, the stronger they become, but it's actually uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure comes from a place of courage. And so um, with vulnerability comes resilience, okay? And so when we know that we're able to understand and analyze and accept our vulnerabilities, which will take us to a stronger place later, immediately in the long term, in the short term, then with all of that comes resilience, not resistance to a situation, but resilience. And so what is resilience via mentoring in social care? So then again, there is an idea that resilience psychologically means resistance, right? And so resilience is something, resistance is actually, um, resistance, is, resistance is activated by survival strategies. So I resist the situation, so I'm gonna go and maybe detach from the situation. If I detach from the situation, I apply a survival strategy because I'm resisting the idea of this situation. I'm gonna go numb myself so that I resist the feelings of these situations. That's different from resilience. Resilience comes from a place of vulnerability. I accept it. I understand that I may be applying some survival strategies. For example, when we observe a teacher in a classroom, you know, what survival strategies are being activated by the behavior of the students. And then I don't resist it. I understand it. I assimilate it. I analyze it. And then I'm able to form resilience towards that specific situation. It's really, according to research, resilience is related to practice, to practice critical awareness. I am being critical, but I'm not being judgmental. I can dissect and analyze what is happening inside me and deconstruct it so that I'm able to reach out and tell my story, be vulnerable in order to be resilient. And resilience is, is related to empathy. And according to research, empathy has been divided into uh, more or less four pillars. The first one is to be able to see the world as others see it, right? So empathy, this is the most obvious one. We're able to see the world as others see it. Then we're gonna see the practical applications from a social care given uh, point of view. The second one is uh, to be non-judgmental. Of course, we cannot be empathetic if we're judgmental. And we cannot be empathetic if we're judgmental about our own, our, our, about ourselves. So we cannot be non-judgmental to another person if we're being non if we're being judgmental to ourselves. And so it's very important for a for a mentor or for a social caregiver to understand when we're give, when we're being judgmental to our own actions, ourselves, our feelings, etc. So it takes a lot of internal deconstructive work. To understand another person's feelings, of course, this is very similar to number one. And then number four, to communicate our understanding of that person's feelings. How is it that I can convey the idea that I understand how this person's feeling to the person who's feeling, who's going through that feeling, let's say. 
okay? And so what I've done here is um, sort of look at different practical ways in which we can apply number one and two and three and four to develop empathy so that we are able to develop resilience from a place of vulnerability for mentors, caregivers, or whoever is involved in the well-being of a group of people or a person. So how are these four attributes to empathy adopted from a practical point of view in the mentoring process towards social caregivers, okay? So the first one is to be able to see the world as others see it. And from a practical, efficient point of view, we have some accessible exploratory techniques, right? How can we see the world as the person in front of me seeing it without asking questions? So we have questionnaires, we have interviews, we have needs analysis, etc. And all that is conducive to empathy. So when we do that, we get an accurate view of what the caregivers may be going through in the day to day by observation, by question, well, questionnaires, by different exploratory techniques, we can see, we know what they're going through on their day to day. And designing these exploratory techniques is a very challenging job, let's say, but it's worth it in the long term. And then finally choosing, it helps us choose the most accurate diagnosis and then be able to design an action plan, an empathetic action plan. What is it that this person need to be able to meet their strengths to the challenges that are presenting in front of this person, in front of them, okay? Second one is to be non-judgmental. We've talked a lot about this already, I think, And but what is the relationship between being non-judgmental and improving connection? We observe this a lot when there, there's a lot of disconnection between the intentions and the feelings of somebody who's mentoring and the people who are the mentorees in a classroom, in a lecture hall, in a in a in a little room in a hospital where when where this um, doctor is tutoring their resident students, uh, in families, in a group of uh, employees, etc. Right. So, what is connection? According to research. Connection is the energy that exists between people when they feel seen. So somebody is seen, but it's not just seeing what's in front of them. Somebody is seen beyond what's in front of them. Um, when you feel heard, so somebody's listening to me and being heard without judgment and valued. Valued means that it's okay for me to express my vulnerabilities here because they're going to be valued when they can give and receive without judgment. They can give all of that and they receive without judgment. And when they derive sustain, sustenance and strength from the relationship. So how these two, these first two ideas or concepts make the relationship stronger. And so how do we do it in a very practical way, let's say in a day-to-day -day sort of basis? We create as mentors, as social caregivers, the idea is to create a safe environment in which we acknowledge these feelings of connections, we acknowledge the fact that we're seeing this person beyond what we see in front of us, that we hear all the needs, that we hear everything that has to be said um, from this person, and that we value all the, all the actions that they take to be able to express their vulnerability. So there is acknowledgement. And it's very important to point this out and to make it explicit during the mentoring process. Also, mentors teach, let's say, the social caregiver not to exercise judgment by not exercising judgment. This is experiential learning. By them being in a situation in which they're not being judged, but they're being uh, mentored, um, we are teaching them and we're helping them understand what being non-judgmental means so that when they go out there and work with people, they exercise the same skills. And finally, it strengthens the relationship. All parts are involved. So it's necessary as a mentor to involve all parts, the caregiver, the care receiver, and also ourselves, the mentor, and to know our role. So this is owning our part that I was talking about earlier, okay? After this, there's a couple, there's a time for questions. So I'm sorry if I'm speaking too much. And three and four, to understand another person's feelings and to communicate your understanding of that person's feelings. So we apply principles of giving and receiving feedback the cyclical loop that I talked to you about before, okay? We communicate such understanding to the caregiver in order to provide them with an opportunity to express their feedback regarding the caregiving process. So we open up 
and we open the door to sort of receive feedback and then start our actions from that specific feedback. So it's caregiver centered. And therefore, all of this is a process, all of this process of connection, of building, of building connection and, and therefore building resilience is organic, is ever evolving, it always changes. And it's a process of back and forth communication. So spoken and unspoken communication via observation. And therefore there's better care and more accurate diagnosis in general. So we're doing social diagnosis and if we're in a medical institution, all of that help us see how that non-medical, non-clinical diagnosis is related to the other areas of diagnosis. So guys, any questions so far? We have about 30% left of the presentation. Um, do we have any questions, any comments so far? Thank you, Mariola, you need information. Exactly, you need as much information as possible. So listening is really, really important. Of course, we're doing a webinar now and it's like, it's, it's monodirectional, but if we were in a room, we'd be talking about all of this more openly. And you also need training, exactly, Mariola. You need training to be able to receive and to give feedback. Anybody has any questions so far? If not, just say, can you learn to be non-judgmental? Rogelio, this is, um, this, is, this is a really good question. Um, how do we learn to be non-judgmental? By actually receiving feedback. When we receive feedback and we, ana when we analyze and deconstruct our own survival strategies and our own ego, we learn how to be non-judgmental because we don't call our own survival strategies as we don't call them um, uh, defense mechanisms or protective mechanisms or distancing, etc. We call them survival strategies. And because we are aware of our own survival strategies that we all have at some point, maybe some, some of us have more, some of us have less, then we're able to not judge ourselves. So the more we understand our past, the more we understand where our ego comes from, the less judgmental we become of our own self. And therefore, the less judgmental we become towards other people in the mentoring process. So whenever we are involved in any social care or any care, not just social care, but any care sort of situation, um, role that we have or any mentoring role is very important to be able to put ourselves, let's say, on the grill and be able to deconstruct at a personal level all of those things and be able to learn how to be non-judgmental of ourselves. That seems to be the most effective way to do it. And it's not something that ends, it continues. Because if we continue being involved in other people's well-being, the deconstruction and the self-analysis and the self-awareness continues. I hope I've answered your question. Maybe I've over-elaborated, but you know. Um, anybody else? Okay, thank you so much, guys. Remember that the training that we may get in the mentoring process, the ways that we can learn to, um, the different things that we can learn from receiving feedback really, really helps us become non-judgmental. The thing is, that sometimes when we are starting that process of understanding what feedback means, we get feedback, we end up judging ourselves. And so the idea is for us to, with that judgment, work on that and to be able to deconstruct, as I said to Rogelio a minute ago, to be able to deconstruct why is it that we're being judgmental? What survival strategies are being triggered in myself? And to understand where the survival strategies come from. So feedback, receiving feedback, learning how to give feedback, getting some training, but also doing the internal work so that we internalize the, the skills is really important. So let's talk about the last part of it, which is cognition and reason. So why is it the reasons behind it? So we're going to talk a little bit about um, the relationship between um, taking a dynamic cognitive sort of approach of clinical diagnosis, but taking that same approach in non-clinical uh, diagnostic, non-clinical care, okay? Because I'm talking about non-clinical care here, but everything is related because we're talking about a holistic model of care, okay? So 
we're going to talk about the mentor's approach to caregiving as a dynamic cognitive process, right? And I'm going to show you a quote. I don't really show quotes in my presentations, but I'd like to show you this one, okay? So it says, the very dynamic nature of the cognitive process in clinical diagnosis, clinical diagnosis comes from, from cognitive processes. You guys are doctors, you, you know this more than I do. In a patient, maybe one of the special characteristics of both medical knowledge and the diagnostic task, which can explain some departures of clinical reasoning from cognition in non-medical domains. And so we're taking a look at this non-medical domain, the mentorship, the mentoring domain, the social caregiving domain, but applying the same principle so that it becomes holistic. So in the holistic approach of to care, the way in which diagnosis is treated is, is also it's also from, sorry, there's a typo. It's also from the non-medical domain and perspective as it follows a social educational approach to treatment. So when we're social caregivers, we have an educational approach, a social educational approach to treatment, to follow up, to, to um, building skills, etc. So what does that mean? Clinical diagnosis is a very dynamic cognitive process, which means that mentoring and social caregiving treat social diagnosis in the same way. So what are we gonna do here? I'm gonna show you how, um, we've done this at Fundacion ASI as well, but in other in institutions too, and how we've uh, taken higher order thinking skills, higher order cognitive skills and lower order cognitive skills, basically the Bloom's taxonomy for educational objectives in the cognitive domain and how we've used these to sort of improve or work on our mentoring process and our social caregiving process, okay? And so what happens is that this transdisciplinary association, so from the, from the clinical diagnosis to non-clinical environments, this transdisciplinary association, not interdisciplinary, where we can see the similarities and difference, but transdisciplinary, which means that it has the same hierarchy, it's all the same, and, and, it, and it's a holistic, let's say, approach, enhances the principles of holistic approach to your diagnosis and therefore care, okay? And so, how do mentors and social caregivers make this dynamic cognitive process explicit and accessible? So in education, to sort of help our students, whoever we're tutoring, mentoring, etc., we use six different, um, we use six different actions, let's say, or functions. We use remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. Actually, we do a lot of work in terms of assessment, formative assessment, et cetera, in the educational and the psychological field, okay? So some of, them, some of these are lower order thinking skills and some of, them are, some of these are higher order thinking skills. And this is from the educational point of view in developing thinking skills, okay? And so we've got the first one is remembering. Uh, why is it considered, they go from less challenging to more ch to the most challenging ones. So remembering, why is remembering the first one? Remembering has to do with recall, remembering information. I know some people that can't remember the lyrics of a Japanese song because they love Japanese animation. They can sing in Japanese, but they don't understand what they're saying because understanding is the next, a cognitive skill uh, up, let's say, in terms of challenge. Understanding is um, can they, can people explain things? Can people um, talk about the main idea of things? Applying is, it, is related to empathy. Applying is related to personalization. Can I, every time we read the newspaper, we apply the content of what we're reading into a different context, which is our lives, for example. So we're all the time applying what we're reading to our, to our lives, which is a different context, okay? So it's taking information from a specific context and using it in a different context. Analyzing, breaking the information in little pieces, comparing and contrasting, classifying, analyzing the information, evaluating, we do it all the time in education, we are assessing, formatively assessing. This is when a person is able to give their opinions, to understand the pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages, etc. And then finally creating, creating new products, creating 
new ideas, creating new processes, etc. Okay, so the process of creating comes from the fact that we're all we all have imagination. Imagination can turn into creativity, and then creativity can turn into innovation. Hopefully, so I just wanted to give you a little idea of of the order of these functions, let's say, of these cognitive skills, these thinking skills that we use in education and how we've applied those to the mentoring role, caregiving role, social caregiving role in different contexts. So I'm gonna start with these first three, okay? The first one is remembering. So mentors gather information, gather background information to explore the caregiver's historical background and psychosocial context. So, we're able to remember, to recall this information. The information is also gathered from other areas of care. If I'm in an institution with different areas, I'm gonna be able to collect information to interview people, etc. Understanding the information, we take a comprehensive approach. So we try to understand the specificity of the caregiver's present situation and relate it to each specific situation through empathy and therefore we build resilience. And applying is we gather techniques and strategies as mentors, we gather techniques and strategies from other previous experiences and contexts in their specialized field and apply them to a specific caregiver situation. So we apply a situation, a past experience that we've had, a pattern that we've seen in that person's family um, network, and we apply it to a specific situation, okay, from experience. And finally, the three tops, which is analyzing, evaluating, and creating. So what do we do as mentors? We analyze the situation, we compare, we contrast, we make connections, and we find patterns to, to reach a more accurate social diagnosis in the mentoring process, which leads to a better global diagnosis. What's happening with this person? Why are the consequences the way they are? How can we help them deal with strengths and challenges, etc.? So it becomes a little bit more of a systematic way to approach the caregiving process. Evaluating. And evaluating occurs throughout the whole process of diagnosis. We're always evaluating social diagnosis here. We're talking about social diagnosis, needs analysis. We receive feedback from caregivers throughout the counseling sessions, throughout the mentoring sessions, and we evaluate the least and most effective decisions, the strengths and the challenges that they present, not from a place of judgment, we are evaluating, um, taking an existing strategies, what for, to improve them through follow-up interviews. It's a, assessment is a very organic, ever-changing process. It never stops. And finally, creating, innovating and creating new strategies and procedures based on personalization, which is applying, based on inclusion, based on proactivity, right? I'm already predicting what may come. And so that helps me be creative. And flexibility, I have to adapt to the specific situations in the creation of new action plans in social care. So this is an example of this is what, for example, Fundación Ace um, took and the social work team um, did during the pandemic and how they were able to help their patients and help their caregivers um, giving them tools, etc., during the pandemic time, during the pandemic, um, by means of tele telematic communication. Okay. Do we have any questions so far, guys? I just have to talk about the last part of the presentation, and then we're done. Any questions so far? If there are any questions about this part, there's a paper I've written about it and it can be available to you guys in which I've, in which I've elaborated this idea a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Okay. And finally, we've just talked, we've talked about individual resilience. We've talked about analyzing our vulnerabilities and accepting them and talking about resilience but what about collective resilience? And I'm gonna talk a little bit about specifically collective resilience in the times of the pandemic here, okay? So collective resilience is, is related to, to community resilience approaches. And according to research, uh, community resilience approaches have to do with four different pillars. 
building community and enhancing social connectedness. And I'm gonna elaborate on this a little bit more and the practical applications of these ideas. Collectively telling the story of the community's experience and response. Okay, telling story. So this has to do with historical continuity, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about in a minute. Reestablishing the rhythms and routines of life, keeping things more or less the way they were and arriving at a positive vision of the future with renewed hope. So these four ideas, we've applied them with teachers, for example, or with tutors at the moment in different areas, whoever is um, involved in the well-being or the, or the caregiving of, of people, of communities, or one person, etc. cetera. Um, so how have these four themes been encompassed to build community resilience in a practical way? So building community and enhancing social connectedness and collectively telling the story of the community's experience and response. So for every intervention, there's been an assessment process. There's been a needs analysis process for the community, for whoever the community is uh, formed by. So, so that there is a reestablishment of the continuity between the past, present, and future. So we've taken, we've, we've um, done assessments and we've, we've um, taken, um, we've run assessments, sorry, there's been an assessment process to reestablish the continuity of what things were like before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and how we think that it's gonna be after the pandemic, for example. Okay, so what have we done? We've assessed the caregiver situation pre-pandemic and during the pandemic, what difficulties they're having, um, what difficulties um, they were having before the pandemic as well, comparing and contrasting these two difficulties, analyzing this process, and then taking into account the specific needs during the lockdown period, such as, for example, lack of availability of physical resources, facilities, they're not able to go to different places. So how is it that we've helped them, for example, how is it that we've helped teachers deal with this situation when they've been teaching during lockdown or mentoring during lockdown, et cetera. And also we've assessed possible future needs, we've predicted because we understand the, the needs uh, during the pandemic, we are assessing possible future needs, we're predicting the future needs and how the day-to-day -day and decision-making process regarding caregiving duties may change after the lockdown period. Maybe the lockdown period has made me think a little bit about different strategies that I'm going to be taking into account after this period, okay? So we've been involved in this, in this sort of process. And also we've taken into account that the stories and histories emerge that shed light on the social, cultural, and historical context of the situation that we're dealing with in front of us as well as on the ways in which families or different kinds of communities confront their problems. And so what does this mean? That we have relate to how a specific community responds to uncertainty. Different communities respond to uncertainty in many different ways, according to their background most of the time. We have tried to give caregivers or social caregivers and mentors specific tools and guidance to be able to explore to be able to talk about and express how um, in, in their own history and their own story, how do their families, their communities, how they dealt with collective vulnerabilities, how they dealt with being resilient and how they dealt with different challenges. And this is called historical continuity. Historical continuity is really important. How is it that they saw somebody deal with it maybe when they were younger? And finally, three and four, um, re-establishing the rhythms and routines of life, keeping the routine as, as close as it was before the pandemic is possible and arriving at a positive vision of the future, which is very challenging, but maybe we can have renewed hope. So in the practical, in, in the practical, in practical terms, this means accommodating routines. So basically guidance handling paperwork, a lot of people had a lot of problems handling paperwork, guidance and training in how to start or continue the pre-established routines before the pandemic. How is it that they can adapt to this new situation? How is it that we can help them adapt and we can help them um, express those needs? 
training on the specificity of each of the situations. So your situation is different from somebody else's. Let's explore this situation. It's part of the mentoring process and how to manage caregiving duties during the pandemic. And finally, how to continue with the caregiver self-care duties. They were already caring for people. They were already taking care of people. They were already um, involved in somebody else's well-being. Now, in the time of the pandemic, is even more straining. So how is it that that person is able to take care of themselves from different levels, right? Also at an emotional level too. And so finally, all of these strategies for community resilience bring a sense of continuity, a sense of familiarity. Try, we try to give a positive vision towards the future. We were able to do it now. We're able to be resilient. Now when the future comes, uh, we're probably going to be able to apply the strategies that we've developed now during this very challenging times to the future, to what comes. We sort of help people or work with people develop coping mechanisms for uncertainty and how to deal and not judge uncertainty and also how to be able to be uh, aware of their vulnerabilities as a means to reach resilience. And finally, well, with all of these concepts, hopefully building a little bit of resilience and then understanding the difference between resilience and resistance to a very challenging situation. Guys, I am 15 minutes, uh, I finished 15 minutes later than what I, than what I expected. Uh, so any final comments or questions that you may have, please use the chat box if you'd like to uh, make a comment or ask any questions so far. Well, any final questions, so that's, that's the end of it. Thank you so much, Alva. Thank you for the feedback. Um, remember, guys, that uh, this all comes from research. So if you would like to see the available references, research, and everything, um, let me know. Um, this is my email address. Um, if there are not any more questions or comments, etc., cetera, uh, thank you so much for attending. And thank you so much for sparing an hour and 20 minutes of your time uh, listening to these ideas. Um, so this is my email address in case you have any, any other questions that I can address later. Okay, so thank you so much. And I hope you're well and you're keeping safe and having a nice week. Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you very much, Lola. Thank you very much, Lola. And and so, sometimes, sometimes uh, I think that clearly all of uh, all of us we are using and using and working in this way of of uh, of uh, style to work and and uh, and with this concept of the holistic care in Fundación Afe. Because as you have mentioned, uh, to work with uh, patients and caregivers centered model is really an holistic model. Because I, I, I don't know if other institutions include basic research neuropsychological team, neurological team, social worker team, CEOs, CEOs, in order to, to, to take decisions and to take decisions and to understand as better as possible the, post, the, the, diag the diagnosis and the process of the cognitive worsening and uh, another, uh, how to help our our environment, including persons, including professionals, including families, including the stakeholders, policy makers, to understand how it's important to include the process of cognitive decline 
in every day of our life. And thank you very much to understand this one. Thank you. And thank you to improve, maybe improve our, our everyday work, our everyday relationship with our patients and families, and of course, our everyday work with each another of the family that its name Fundación Ace. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Merce. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for the feedback. Bye now. No more questions, no more comments. Lola Jas, thank you so much for your lecture and for the way you have explained everything, this lovely journey you have, we have gone through these complex uh, concepts that you have explained in such a clear way. And we have been able to clarify a lot of, of these uh, uh, activities that we are doing during during the day in our model of care, but that you have explained and we have been able to translate in our daily practice. And as Merce said, uh, I hope it, they will it will help us to to improve and to in make and be able to give more value of our daily practice. Thank you so much for this translation that from the concepts to our real world. Thank you so much, Alba. Thank you so much for the feedback. It's very humbling to, to share these ideas with you guys. And uh, thank you for having me. So, and I hope uh, to see you again soon, maybe face to face, you know, and not in the virtual world. Hope so. Soon. <laughs> hope so. And thank you, Marce, for your words at the end of the presentation. So it's been really nice. And thank you guys for your feedback and thank you for your questions and your participation, and I'm sorry I went over time. <laughs> so um, take lots of care of yourselves, and um, I hope to see you again soon. OK? OK. All right. Thank you very much. All yeah. right. OK. okay. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, and thank you.